Joining me now to break down the rules or lack thereof of super PACs is James Ingram, political science lecturer at SDSU and UC San Diego. Thank you for being here, James. So remind our audience, these super PACs are a result of what court ruling? There was a decision in 2010 called Citizens United, and this is the case that President Obama discussed in his State of the Union address upon taking office. And in that decision, the courts basically opened the doors for all kinds of campaign, you know, campaign work by corporations. So we've always had PACs or political action committees here in California. So how are super PACs different and do they not have to follow the rules of PACs? Right. Well, the um, the 527s, these super PACs of these 527s, they exist under Section 527 of the of the IRS code. So they're, you know, they're a tax entity. But this political action committees is a longer term form, you know, had vet since uh, federal law in the early 1970s. And California started regulating them in 1974. So it's been and, you know, we have a nearly 40 year long history with the, the PAC phenomenon. And, and in California, if you're a PAC, you do have to disclose who's giving you money, don't you? Right. We have our disclosure laws that require all of our political action committees act to, acting in state local elections in this state. And that's part of our Political Reform Act that we passed in 74 and we've been amending, you know, ever since. So if you are a super PAC, that is based here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Do you not have? Do you have to follow any of the California rules regarding PACs and disclosure? Oh right, right. Those those acts, those um, laws of disclosure would apply to super PACs operating here in our state's races. Exactly. So I mean, you can't do anything in the state law that would violate the constitutional rulings that the Supreme Court made. You can't put limitations on those um, PACs that the Supreme Court already said are not allowed. But disclosure requirements have been okay. So if you're a super PAC outside of California that doesn't have disclosure laws, mm -hmm. you don't have to disclose. Then those, those wouldn't, um, California wouldn't be monitoring those types of activities, right? So do you think as a result of that, do we end up with fewer super PACs actually being launched here out of California because we've got different rules or, or we have disclosure rules? Yeah, it's possible we'll see, um, right, we might see out of state types of PACs that would be cautious about this state. Maybe we would get our own PACs that are more, you know, used to dealing with our laws that would, you know, prevent themselves from you know, facing some kind of lawsuit by the, you know, by the FPPC. We haven't got a lot of time left, James, but in your opinion, how are the super PACs sort of changing the campaign dynamic? I think I'm seeing negative campaigning like never before because of the idea that these super PACs are at a hand's reach away from the candidates. But I think the, 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 the public's going to be a lot more sophisticated and realize that if the super PAC is working with the candidate, then it's that they're responsible. I mean, this idea you're going to have uncoordinated, you know, that they're uncoordinated when now candidates are allowed to show up at super PAC events and help them raise funds. I mean, how, more, how much more coordinated can you get? And yet that's legal. That's allowed. So. You know, I think the public will really eventually learn to public or punish candidates if they've, you know, done some really negative campaigning through their super PACs. They're not going to be, you know, they'll be smart enough to see that and act accordingly. Okay, James Ingram, thanks for yeah. being here. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks.